Hello, my name's Aaron Parker. Um, today I'll be talking about adolescence. Um, I'm just going to introduce everyone. This presentation will provide a critical review of research around adolescence. The research areas being discussed will be psychopathology in adolescence presented by myself, response to authority in adolescence presented by Cameron Gillette, adolescence aggression in aggression presented by Deborah Large, and peer influence related to partic particularly to smoking presented by Stephanie Nabura. Okay, on to my psychopathology in adolescence. Darlene Hurry described adolescence as a crucial transformative stage from childhood to adulthood. Various researches such as Shichetti 2002 and Fairchild 2011 suggest psychopathology is manifested within adolescence. According to Costello 2011, one in five adolescents has a psychological condition. Research has shown problems in adolescence such as socialisation, family issues, substance abuse and living conditions i.e. poverty are linked to the manifestation and the continuation of psychopathology and psychological disorders throughout adolescence. Research by Horndorf et al. 2013 shows that the development of social issues manifest in adolescence by way of social isolation and lack of group group interaction. On to psychological disorders related to psychopathology. Horndorf et al. 2013 links psychological, psychological disorder to be an uh, indicator of psychopathology within adolescence. Examples of this are anxiety, depressive mood and somatization disorders which means to manifest um, them physically. In 1999, Ford noted that the British Child and Adolescence Mental Health Survey study showed that there was an increased rate of depression as children moved into adolescence, significantly within females. This also showed an increase of range of disorders, i.e. substance abuse, anxiety, separation anxiety and agoraphobia. Johnson et al. 2013 showed a study in emotional irregularities. This showed emotional irregularities in adolescence linked to poor social skills and depression. Fairchild 2011 also showed how their behaviour behavior changes well during adolescence if they have psychological disorders and psychopathology. Um, it can become risk-taking and reward-seeking. Traits and limitations and successes of the studies. A recurring topic of the literature is the assumption that psychopathology manifests within adolescence. A divide, a diverse range, there's a diverse range of studies, disciplines and method, methodologies which is a positive because it gives an all-round wider perspective of knowledge and results. Most of the studies show a link to depression and, and psychopathology, which is a good link, it's a key, key link. Um, Lehay et al. 2012 noted the correlation between uh, symptom expectations and the actuality of, of the actual symptoms, a reliability of reporting results as well, uh, self report self-reporting in particular. Limitations. Failure to consider socialisation and individual difference between participants, um, extroversion, introversion especially, um, that could score a psychopathology on certain standardised tests. Uh, longitudinal studies also, um, losing participants, quality of the participants affects the quality. Okay. On to ethics. Age range. Um, the participants usually 13 to 18 year olds, so that could affect the studies. Um, in this is the consent, getting consent from this, you need parents' consent as well. Um, and consent can change at any point with that because you need two, two forms of consent. Uh, the participation collection, to, uh, the way you do this, I mean, you'd probably be in schools or uh, in clubs. By doing that, with them being of the age range they are, um, you'd, have to, you'd have to get a DBS authority and stuff like that. A diverse culture, diversity and culture bias as well. Different cultures have different uh, perspectives on life. Um, things could change, results could change as well. Um, economic situations, poverty uh, or being well, uh, well off, uh, that could change the results as well. And changing the mind and longitudinal studies, that's a big ethical concern when it comes to this sort of study. Conclusion. There's a diverse range of studies to draw information on. Within this, there's a diverse range of methods, methodological approaches, to gather, to gather a range of data types um, and different disciplines, such as uh, social psychology, developmental psychology and emotional psychology. Um, it's a key area slash age in which studies can be performed to assess the beginning of psychopath psychopathological manifestation. Studies in psychopathology with adolescents provide indicators into how psychopathological psycholog psycho disorders manifest and relate to psychopathology. Further studies such as studies into how these disorders and psychopathology uh, act in later life into, adult into adulthood and how that is continued. Okay, I'll pass you on to Cameron Gillette. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cameron and I will be talking about responses to authority in adolescents. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about parental perceptions and how they can affect uh, development in later life. So, to start with, uh, meta-analysis has shown that 20-40% of adolescents in the UK 
uh, receive physical punishment from the parents, and that applies to Germany as well. It's widely believed across psychological researchers that different parenting styles can have a significant effect on development in later life, and positive perceptions of your parents can lead to healthier and more no uh, healthier and respond better to authority in later life if the perceptions are good. Uh, this is so looking at research more specifically, uh, Learn et al. in twenty sixteen drew attention to the fact that research hasn't been as rigorous as it could have been in the past. Uh, this is due to a variety of reasons, uh, which we'll come across in a few slides. But firstly, uh, Kuha and Rita, Rita in 2013 uh, showed researchers have established a series of groups uh, to place parents in, based on their style. The problem with this is though, is that, um, and research based on this, like this sort of method, is that it places parents in groups, which might not always be the case. For example, your parents' style might change depending on circumstances and other factors, so you're not like that type of parent 100% of the time, and it doesn't account for external factors that influence it. Additional research into perceptions of parent styles uh, by Samantha 1995 showed that there's a difference in perceptions, and he, uh, she used 110 adolescents aged 16 to 18, and the experiment showed, once again, that there is a relationship between the two variables and it also showed that the adolescents were less likely to engage in deviant behaviour, so another experiment. Um, but the problem with this experiment in particular was that it consisted of 108 mothers and 92 fathers, which means that it's unbalanced uh, and it's sort of like, um, it doesn't account for step-parents, adopted parents and Diverse parents, which means that um, obviously it could be different because the bond is different between different families and different things. For example, um, how the step parents or the adopted parents enter the adolescent's life might influence their bond with them, which could influence the perceptions, which lead to which leads to change, which leads to deviant behaviour in their life. Jackson in 2002 carried out research on substance abuse, and he showed that it was due to negative perceptions of the parents in the adolescent's life that ultimately that, that contributed to the fact that they uh, have substance abuse problems. Um, this research is backed up by Parker et al in 2004 who used a massive sample of 16,749 adolescents and found the same result. So, negative parent parental perceptions also affect emotional development, more specifically emotional intelligence. Uh, adolescents have, who, have, um, who have negative perceptions of their parents have difficulty expressing themselves in a way that's socially acceptable. Uh, research by Sensetti and Toth found out that adolescents that have behavioural problems are less likely to respond to authority better. Uh, so more specifically parent control methods, they're less likely to respond well to them. Uh, but how the problem we have is how can it be distinguished between adolescents with behavioural problems and just ordinary adolescent development? How do we distinguish and separate the two? Uh, the main method of course is the DSM-5, which shows, which tells us that the symptoms have to be persistent and you have to span across a period of time and cause an inference with the interference, sorry, with the adolescent's life before they can be diagnosed. So, in conclusion, research in this area is hard to do because of ethics. Obviously, we can't go telling parents to uh, abuse their children to see what would happen and what effect that would have. Uh, it's difficult to place parents in groups because they're forever changing. Uh, one time they might be one type, another might be another type, so we can't place them in the group, so perhaps a qualitative approach might be more effective to finding out what actually, to offer a bigger insight into this area. <clears throat> it doesn't really account for single step or adopted parents, and it doesn't draw like, uh, any specific attention to the nature of the relationship between the two. And it doesn't account for individual differences within the adolescent. For example, how you react to a situation, how I react to a situation will be totally different. So, yeah. I'll now pass you on to Debbie, who will talk about research and adolescent aggression.
My name is Deborah Large and I'll be discussing research articles relating to adolescent aggression. Evidence suggests that sex differences in adolescent aggression have been reported since the 1920s, but not in the way that aggression was acted out, but based on the idea that females did not display aggression. In 1961, Arnold Bush wrote, women are so seldom aggressive that female aggression is not worth studying. This attitude continued in the 1970s but had begun to change by the early 1980s. Early studies reported that aggressive, aggressive behaviours could be observed from two to two and a half years old and the aggression observed between male and females does not differ till around six years old. The differences then continue in adolescence with males being more overtly aggressive and females being more covertly aggressive. Nearly all new studies on adolescent aggression carried out today contain male and female participants. One study found that highly aggressive females will remain more aggressive over time than highly aggressive males. This goes against the general norms of male aggression for nearly all of the studies. Sources outside the self also become an issue that affect adolescent aggression and the age at which this change takes place can have an impact on studies carried out, especially with 11 to 12 year old participants. Aggression in adolescence is viewed differently in different perspectives of psychology. In evolutionary psychology, where studies looked at levels of testosterone produced during puberty along the level, alongside the levels of aggression displayed, found that the testosterone had an effect on aggression. However, a study carried out by Harpin in 1994 concluded that levels of testosterone produced during puberty were too low to have a significant effect on male aggression. Social psychology looks at aggression as an issue created by environmental factors mixed with social and economical status. The way in which aggression is studied is also varied with the type of aggression being studied. There's proactive and reactive aggression. Until recently, these two types of aggression have not been studied for the purpose of adolescent aggression alone. And only when looked at other issues that affected aggression. Proactive aggression is displayed when there's no trigger to the aggression and reactive is in response to a trigger. This is hard to monitor and record with adolescents as the he said, she said, when aggression is displayed can cause an issue as to whether or not the behaviour is proactive or reactive. This leads on to the issue of language. Language and terminology used in older studies of aggression looked only at overt or direct aggression, whereas new studies look at overt aggression as well as covert aggression. Different studies have different names and slightly different meanings across studies. The terms used being single, relational, covert and indirect aggression. Before the introduction of direct aggression to studies, or of indirect aggression to studies, direct aggression was seen as a behaviour carried out by socially isolated individuals with low social intelligence. New studies that include direct aggression, indirect aggression, allow aggressors to fit into groups with high social intelligence and to be less socially isolated. In fact, Rose 2004 found that popular males were viewed by peers as being more overtly aggressive and popular females as being more covertly aggressive than the peer groups. This led to different differences in findings between studies and the possible need to separate studies when looking at aggression to get an accurate result. The self-report and peer reporting that is used when carrying out real-world research can affect results, especially when studying adolescents aggression. It is difficult for females to admit being manipulative and scheming, and males over-exaggerate being overtly aggressive. This also is an issue with peer reporting in groups of friends, close female friends, don't want to affect friendships, and male peers will also exaggerate aggression for friends while downplaying it for others. This kind of reporting does change as adolescents age and can be seen through longitudinal studies as adolescents' priorities change. Longitudinal studies have the issue with attrition as well as changes in school districts, financial issues and participant sizes. In nearly all adolescent aggression studies, participant sizes are between 300 to 1,000 across classes and ages, so the studies can be applied to most. This subject is one of the best in the areas of study for participant groups. Archer, 2004, found that lab settings for aggression used smaller sample sizes and that the results did not match those that have been found in real world settings, meaning the lab testing carried out could be misleading and that lab testing only works with smaller sizes when looking at individual traits. Another limitation of aggression studies are uncontrolled variables, undiagnosed mental health issues, drug and alcohol abuse, social and economic class, and social acceptance of aggression in the demographic location of the study. Although they can be reduced, it is difficult without full honesty, which may be hard in some areas when working with adolescents 
This cannot be totally avoided and may have an impact on results, for example, where adolescent drug use is an issue in a specific area. Moving forward, to gain a better insight into a question, the study can be carried out on the individual subject rather than trying to group different types of aggression together and mixing males and females to try and get norms. As gender norms are continually changing, new generation of new youth may produce a totally different set of results and that's been seen throughout the research that's been carried out. I'll now pass you over to Steffi. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, hi, my name is Steffi and uh, I am talking about peer influence and adolescent smoking initiation. The content of my presentation is grounded on empirical evidence which is displayed synthesized within the presentation slides. With 46% of cancer patients in the UK starting to smoke during adolescence, youth smoking has been recognized as a major preventable risk factor for cancer. In order to develop targeted prevention strategies, numerous research was conducted reporting peer influence as the single most important factor for this phenomenon. The issue here is that those findings are divided into two opposite fields of the spectrum uh, with so-called peer pressure on one end, proposing that direct peer influence, such as offering cigarettes to an adolescent with negative consequences for the teen if resisting the offer. This scenario sees the adolescent as a passive agent who simply gives in to the pressure of the peer group he or she wants to be part of. On the other end of the spectrum is the so-called friendship selection, proposing that the adolescent is the active agent in smoking initiation because he or she selects peers according to own innate characteristics, attitudes and behaviours. The articles on this slide uh, present empirical evidence for this proposal and also provide details about what characteristics are more likely to be found in an individual who is likely to take on smoking. Analyzing the empirical evidence presented, a number of methodological approaches can be identified, such as longitudinal research design. With a number of strengths as listed, you can see improving the robustness of those study results. However, limitations are also present, with the main disadvantage being age-related changes potentially being distorted due to bias sampling, selective attrition, practice effects and or cohort effects, presenting a threat to the validity of those studies. Arnett, Hoskin and Corbus proposed to apply so-called sequential designs as an alternative because they provide the opportunity to conduct a multitude of longitudinal investigations, avoiding the aforementioned limitations. Another reoccurring methodological approach um, were found within the information gathering methods, mainly in the form of self-reports, with its strengths such as providing the opportunity to gather in-depth information, but equally with a range of limitations, the main disadvantage here being that the responses are potentially subject to inaccurate reporting due to self-report bias, including social desirability and recall bias. And secondly, relying on adolescent reports of peer smoking behaviour. Again, providing rich in-depth data, however, limitations such as the so-called false consensus effect, the cognitive bias, Leading to, leading to exaggeration of the degree of similarity between the adolescent and the peers, presenting a threat to the validity of those studies. Obtaining multi-interview data from the adolescent, peers and other individuals from the social environment poses an alternative. And last but not least, reporting evidence of causation, whilst the research data is correlational only. Basically, reporting that data showed that two events which occurred together have established a cause and effect relationship when in reality they only correlate. Concluding, it can be stated that there is a discordance amongst researchers regarding the significant level of influence versus selection process concerning the phenomenon 
of smoking onset during adolescence, and also that limitations occur within the findings of both fields as presented here. The proposition is that both presented origins are not mutually exclusive, and also that further research is needed in order to overcome those limitations and to gain deeper insight into this phenomenon of adolescent smoking initiation and also to provide more effective prevention strategies. This almost brings our presentation to an end. However, we would like to raise your attention for a few more minutes to reflect on our project. Thank you very much. Um, I'm the first to reflect and um, I have to say that working on this project made me aware that I have to improve my time management. Um, I feel like I could be scheduling better as to organise my time better and to organise my work better and it would probably benefit my work by scheduling uh, certain times for certain things and improve my reading and writing skills. Thank you. Moving forward, I need to be able to manage my time better when working with others and take into consideration that they've also got life commitments, so I need to be more flexible and compromise more when working on group projects. Thank you. A point of reflection, I've found that I've learned from loving a group that I need to search for more research than I initially thought to make sure that I'm well familiarised with the subject. Thank you. Uh, here is a list of references for each of the subjects. <laughs>